It's witchcraft. <laughs> Welcome, witches, pagans, heathens, and magical souls to the Solarium, Shell and Layla's sunlit, herb filled sanctuary, where we put our basomes down, hang up our pointy hats. And sometimes Shell puts her cursing finger away. We spend our time sipping tea, toking herbs, and reading books if we're lucky. Today we have a lot of books, actually. Today we're doing like a, I'm calling these the Fab Four, man. Ooh, the Folklore Fab Four. I love it. The Folklore Fab Four. I'm really excited about this because the Fab Four books we're talking about today literally covers all of the Americas. Folk magic right now is such a big topic. We wanted to kind of dive into some offerings from both Llewellyn and Wiser Books. We are going to do an episode at some point here coming up on folk magic, and this is kind of separate and apart. This, we're talking about four specific books. And first of all, shout out to Llewellyn, shout out to Wiser Red Wheel. We appreciate you guys sending us some good stuff to look through. And let's talk folk magic, woman, because this is the hottest thing online right now. Everybody on TikTok, everybody on Instagram, wherever you're from, you're into folk magic. And these are really some awesome books. Folk magic is basically magic of the people. And if we go by one of the books we have here is Llewellyn's Complete Book of North American Folk Magic. And in that book, they give a definition of folk magic basically folk being of the people. And magic, if you go with Aleister Crawley's definition, is to summarize it, it's basically creating change through your will. Wait a second. Okay. So folk magic, are you telling me, is the magic of the people? Then what the hell else is there? Is it all magic, magic of the people? Like what? Is there magic of the non-people? Okay. I'm confused. (laughs) Doesn't that mean everything is folk magic and it just depends on where you're from? Pretty much. Yes. Ha ha, that's why folk magic is popular, because that's, it's all folk magic, folks. <laughs> sort of, yeah. I guess it kind of is all folk magic, because it all does derive from the people. But folk magic, the term specifically refers to types of magic that are regional, types of magic that are intimately tied to the land and to the people that live on that land. Folk magic comes from pretty much everywhere. It comes from people having needs. It comes from practical reasons. You know, back in the day, people needed help with something. They called upon what they had, the herbs, the animals, the spirits, the saints, the religions that they had in their community and in their area. So it's intimately tied to different places. Most of this was not written down because these people, again, were folk people. They were typically lower class and would not have known how to read or write. So these are oral tradition magics. And what one person does here is going to be very different from what someone does in a different community because the blend of cultures, religions, and local flora, fauna, and spirits are going to be different from place to place. So that's what people refer to as folk magic. It's very family specific and area specific. But yeah, I guess technically, like everything's folk magic because it's all of the people. But you know what I loved about this book in particular? The complete book of North American folk magic. First of all, this was kind of, I don't know what the word is, put together, edited, what have you, by Corey Thomas Hutchinson. But this thing, there's like, what, 25, 28 contributors? It really is a compendium. It really is. And I mean, it isn't just about Appalachian folk magic or Pennsylvania, you know, powwow magic. It is like very encompassing of literally every, I don't even know the word for it. North America, every part of the United States, Canada's included in this. This is like an encyclopedia, and I'm in love with this book. Damn it. I am in love with this book. Folk magic is so diverse that what you practice here in your neck of the woods could be, you know, a mile away, could be very different because you know how you know how you like spirit of place? Yes. This is like magic of place. Exactly. Oh, that's a great way to put it. You know, the The people that were here in the Americas first, and then all the people from different places that came here, everybody's beliefs and ideas melded with the land, with the place that they were in, and became very personal 
very magical. Regional is a good word. Very regional. And and a lot of these books mention that. In particular, the the North American folk magic, it, it goes by region and area because folk magic is so personal to place. Now, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have to stop you in your tracks because... I was getting ready to go a little too deep right here from the get-go. You're starting to go a little deep from the get-go. We need to talk about some tea and some token before we go any further on folk magic. So, Layla, what are you drinking? What are you smoking? Everybody needs to know. Well, one of the other books that we recently talked about on social media was A Tea Witch's Grimoire by S.M. Harlow. Shit, I love that book, too. I know. This book is great. I love having it like a recipe book. It's right there. Whenever I have an idea for a tea that I want, I can just check this out. It has tea for everything, including one for Ostara that I just had to try because it looked so delicious. What's in it? Tell us. So this is the spring equinox tea. I put in about a teaspoon of white tea, a teaspoon of jasmine, a teaspoon of rose, and then two teaspoons of dried raspberries. This is so delicious. It's fantastic. I feel like you should put sweet cream creamer in that. You and your cream. I put honey (laughs) in it and just a little bit of lemon. Maybe it's that like British DNA or that that Welsh DNA I got that says put cream in it. But (laughs) I put cream in some of them and this probably would be good with cream, but honey and just a tiny bit of lemon and it's very delicious. So I decided to smoke something just as delicious You know me and gelatos. Oh my God, you love them. I do. That flavor profile is so, so good. So I got some silky gelato from one of the local shops and I mixed in with it a little bit of raspberry leaf and some rose petal along with my favorite mullen. So yeah, it's very nice. I feel like you you smoke mullen with everything. I do. I do. I think everybody should smoke mullen with everything. It's pretty mellow, has a good full smoke. And it doesn't have too harsh of a taste. I kind of like it. The rose isn't too strong. No, the stronger the rose, the better. I don't know if you can get too strong, to be honest. I am such a basic bitch when it comes to rose. Love rose petals in everything, in my tea, in my smoke. I don't care. I will put it in everything. The more like a rose it tastes, the more I like it. I love it so much. It's delicious. Now... You are so not a basic bitch, by the way. We're, we're, we're going to talk about some basic bitch shit here. Tonight, I had to go with store-bought tea. I am drinking my my favorite store-bought iced tea tonight, Turkey Hill. Love them. We do. I think in our other podcast, The Stoned Witches Hour, I think one episode you devoted like the entire intro of the episode to your love. The Turkey Hill tea. Yeah. yeah. So shout out to Turkey Hill. They're a company in Pennsylvania. Most people know their ice cream, but damn it, they have good tea. So I'm drinking that. I, I dub it my crack tea and I am smoking the most fabulous shit. What have you got? So remember I told you I, I found that place that I've been going to recently that, you know, has great prices, great deals. Mm-hmm. Well, guess who started growing their own oh, this nice. company? They used to basically, you know, order wholesale from growers. Mm -hmm. Well, they're still getting other people's shit at their store, basically, but now have their own grow. So this stuff, this is one of their grows, Mandarin Skittles, with a Z, my friends. (laughs) And you know how I am. I'll give you one guess. What is the THC level? At least 32%. Oh my God, you're so close. 30.24. This is good shit, man. I love it. Tasty, but it is very aromatic. We'll call it that. Very aromatic. You're not opening this and hiding it from anybody. No, no. Same thing with this gelato. As soon as you open it, my goodness, it smells so good. Yeah. But, you know, I'm just kind of loving the dispensaries around here because I feel like the competition is kicking up. So the quality is kicking up because of the competition. Every one of these damn places wants your business. Well, give me something to make me choose your store over another. I mean, you've, you've been here, you know that there's five stores within five miles, but yet I choose to go a little further because they have good price, good quality. I just want the good weed for a decent price. One of my favorite things in this area is that every month or so they have a craft market 
where they'll have local growers all get together to sell their cannabis, to sell their other weed products, you know, their cookies, their candies, different things like that, tinctures. Didn't you go to a weed festival? Yeah, here and in California, which blew my mind when I first moved to California from an illegal state to a legal state. Festivals were one of my favorite things to go to. But yeah, here in New York State, cannabis is legal. Going to some of these farmers markets where they have weed there has been really fun. And I've been getting some some great cultivars that way. I'm not going to lie. If someone gave me a bag of dirt weed right now, I might smoke it just for nostalgic purposes. Whoops, did I say that? So still not a pot snob. No, I have, will I? You're the pot snob in this duo here, friend. You know that. Always have been. It's true. But Mandarin Skittles, good shit. Sounds delicious. It does not taste like Mandarin oranges. I wish it no? did. No? Does it have no. any citrus taste at all? Um, A little. A little. But it has that, just that damn good weed taste and smell. Like, I can't explain it other than damn good weed taste and smell. Shell's rule number 56 is that thou shalt not name a weed after a fruit or a food unless the weed tastes like that fruit or food. So obviously they have broken your rule. Why would they do that to me? I don't know. That's terrible. If you call it grape, that shit better taste like grape bubble gum. Seriously. You know, if they tell me it's lemon haze, it tastes like lemon. Those bitches don't lie to me. <laughs> I'm just saying. Usually the lemons are pretty good about it. That's true. But we've decided, especially on our our old podcast, we've talked about how people just get high and make up these names. There's no rhyme or reason. Pretty sure. And I still think they should hire us because we would come up with some excellent names. Right? All right. So before we get too high, Shell, I do want to go over these books. Now, we have talked about this complete book of North American folk magic by Corey Thomas Hutchinson. But like Shell said earlier, this is a compendium of a group of people and It's fantastic. And actually, I realized there is a little, I don't know if you want to call it a chapter or a section on Appalachian folk magic. Pennsylvania Dutch is in there as well. It is. But I just wanted to point out one of the books we are talking about tonight as well is um, Small Magics by H. Byron Ballard. And Byron Ballard actually did the section on Appalachian folk magic in the North American Folk Magic book. Yes. That was a lot of damn words, by the way. (laughs) She will actually be at the Sacred Space Conference with us. Super excited to hear her talk. Super excited. Me too. She is very well known as a folk magic practitioner. And this book, North American Folk Magic, it's put together kind of like a roadmap. And he says he did that on purpose. We're going to talk a lot this episode about spirits of place and about magic of place, like Shell said, and that they recognize that these different blends of magic came to be because of the place. If you lived in a valley or a holler or up on a mountain, that was the magic you knew. Those were the people you trusted. And so that's what you learned. Some of the authors say in this book, you know, that they learned to tie their knots a certain way or to make their teas a specific way or say a charm a certain way, and just, you know, one valley over, it could be entirely different. So they map it out very nicely in this book, and they really give you a great way to look at the United States and all the different folk magic practices across the country. What they actually did was they took the whole of North America, not just the United States, but Mexico and Canada as well, and they kind of broke it up into eight different sections of folk magic. And I was surprised, you know, I'm I'm currently in Salem and there is a New England in maritime folk magic section. I was like, whoa, this shit's cool. And I was also surprised to find out that New York, this was weird to me, the New York section where it falls into was called New Holland. And oh my God, you know how I'm bad with pronunciation Deep Sherry, Deep Sherry, help me out here, Layla. Yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that either. We're going to call it just New Holland. I just was surprised at how many different types of folk magic were practiced in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, aside from the fact, obviously, that what you do a neighbor a mile down the road might do slightly different. I loved reading 
from each person's different perspective. I really liked going through and reading some of these personal stories. They were very rich. They had a lot of information in them. Stephanie Rosebird in this book wrote A Solitary Nature, My Hoodoo Story. And I I want to be her friend. Like I, I related so much to everything that she said here. You know, as we've talked about a bunch in the past, and as you know, my family did a lot of the Pennsylvania Dutch thing. And they go into the German powwow magic uh, of Pennsylvania in this. And you don't see that brought up a lot, which is weird to me. Maybe it's just because I lived it. But you don't see a lot of books written about it or a lot of sections of books written about it. And I thought they did an amazing job. I just kind of really like how it was a lot of different people that practice folk magic in their own way kind of coming together This is, to me, more of a reference book than something you're going to read once cover to cover and be done with. You know what I mean? I feel that you could read it cover to cover once because each person's stories are so rich. But I I agree with you that it it, it works very well as as a reference book. Absolutely read it cover to cover. But I just see myself as well as others kind of going back to it a lot. Oh, yeah. There's so much information here. Each section is just full of history of the area, how that magic came to be, and all the different types of practices and belief systems. Very well done. One thing I didn't know a lot about and I thought was interesting, they go into that Florida swamp magic. Very cool. Very cool. I don't know. I, I definitely think that this is this is a good resource. I absolutely agree. Good for cover to cover, but a good resource book in my opinion. At first, I was afraid that it was going to be a little bit too much like a list, you know, like, here's what this means and here's what that means. I I think it was opposite of that. Oh, it was. But that was my first impression when I first looked at the book. And then when I opened it up and started reading the stories, I was so happy to find that it, it was less textbook than I thought it was going to be. It read very much like stories and interesting converse, you know, interesting information. I think the reason it worked that way is because it was a collaboration of so many different people, just like folk magic is. It, it was very much a melding of different people to make it great. So don't be afraid of it. It's a big book. It looks kind of like a textbook, but it reads. It's so interesting to read and you can jump around. You can read it straight through. You can just keep it as a reference book. Let's be honest. You could take that book and knock someone out with it. Yeah, you absolutely could. It's huge. Yeah. Full of information. It's it's what, like regular standard paper size, eight and a half by 11. It's, oh, it's yeah. a hefty book. Oh, yeah. But don't be intimidated. It's really interesting. Now, I, I want to kind of take that thought and springboard right into our next book, Dream Witchery. And the reason I, I, I want to springboard right to that is because that is almost the same concept. Yes. This is going over kind of like dream folk magic throughout all of South America. So you got North American folk magic that kind of covers North America. And then this dream witchery basically does the same thing and is also a collaboration of multiple people. Shell. What? I love you. Why? I just made a transition, man. (laughs) That was perfect. I totally love you, man, because I had written in my notes, like almost word for word, what you just said. Exact (laughs) same thing. (laughs) I feel the same way. I really liked this book. So we're talking about Dream Witchery, Folk Magic, Recipes and Spells from South America for Witches and Brujas by Elohim Leifar. And I really like this book. I was worried about this for me personally, because... You know that sometimes if something isn't necessarily my jam, I have a hard time mustering through for whatever reason. I I just I haven't gotten into South American magic. So I was worried about this one. But you know what? To me, this was just the South American version of the book we just talked about. I think the reason it worked so well is the collaboration. You know, like I said about the other book, the collaboration of multiple views and opinions and experiences. This one has some pretty badass spells in it, to be honest with you. This one, I would say, is more of a collection of spells 
more so than the North American folk magic. Yeah, that that is kind of like information, and this yeah. is like a spell, spell book. book. And it really is about dreams. There are dream meanings, dream interpretations. There are different sections where different people would go in and talk about a spell that they have or a recipe that they wanted to share. There is kind of tasks in here too. I, I'm not calling it a workbook, but there are to-dos in here, which you know I love a good book with to-dos. Mm-hmm. It's got some exercises. Yeah, little mini rituals or or meditations. This is a good book for that. Yeah, I liked on the dream communication chapter, there's a section about um, visualization exercises. You know, it talks about what moon phase you can do it in, incenses that you can use, and, you know, different exercises you can do to help with your visualization. I was digging the part um, where they, they went over astral travel too. When you first crack open this book, I was reading in the beginning and I, one of the things I really loved about it is they talk about the fact that this is not a Wiccan based system. Right. Folk magic is older than Wicca. Folk magic blends a lot of different local religions and systems so one of the things that Lifar talks about is the fact of in more North American witchcraft, you know, with our Wiccan DNA or whatever, we usually talk about not doing magic on someone without their consent. Right. It's good practice. You don't always have to, but we like to. So he talks about how in this South American folk magic, that's kind of silly because doing spells is as simple to them as breathing pretty much. And if someone needs help, they're going to do a spell for them to help. And he likens it to something like um, if someone's drowning, you're not going to stop and ask them if they want help and wait for them to give you permission. You're just going to reach out and help pull them to shore. And so that's how he talks about doing magic for other people. That's more their belief system. You just do the magic to help someone. You don't ask them if they need it. You just do it. Grab onto your broomstick, witches, back after these messages. Hey, all you witches, pagans, heathens, and magical souls. Shell and I want to give a big thank you to all of our donating patrons. And we want to remind you that if you become a donating patron before April 8th, we'll be doing a drawing for a tarot reading by Shell during the solar eclipse. All you need to do is sign up to donate to the show by April 8th. Thank you so much to everyone who's donating to Back on the Broomstick. It really helps out the show. Keep it witchy. Right. And, you know, you and I actually talked about this the other night. And when you told me that, I was like, you know, you know what? You're freaking on to something. You know, obviously with anything, there is a line in the sand, but you can be on the good side of that line and still be doing spells to help people without their quote unquote permission. But, you know, there's always a line. Don't cross it. And it's a good reminder that things can be very, very different from one belief system to another. That doesn't make it bad. That just means it comes from a different viewpoint, just like this one does. I see this viewpoint and I I really appreciate it and I like it. And honestly, you and I have never done well with the, you know, and it harm none, do what you will. And a little bit too, don't do magic on someone without their permission. But there are times when we have done magic because someone really needed that help. What we're good at, Layla, what we're good at is weighing our consequences. Ooh, I'm, I'm just going to let that one sit there for a minute because that was good. But, you know, even though I find dream magic hard, part of it is because you know that as much as I am the scribe of the world with books of shadows, you know, I technically hate journaling. You do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. A lot of dream work kind of is based around journaling that. So as you can imagine, not my forte. Mm -hmm. And it's not something I'm going to practice for me personally, but I did think it was a very good informative book that is very useful for a lot of folks, just not my personal jam. And actually, and I hope she's listening and she'll have it by the time this airs. I am actually gifting this book after we record this episode to my high priestess in my coven because I know it's her jam. 
Yeah, and everything doesn't always have to click with you perfectly. But Elohim Lefar does have a chapter on the dream journal, right, in this book. <laughs> you know, I, I, and I saw that and I was like, man, he must be friends with Layla because everything goes back to journaling and meditation. It does, though. It does. They talk about it in this book, too. But I am going to put out there for people that dream interpretation is highly personal. While you can look at a book like this dream witchery and get an idea of what different symbols and things mean in dreams, they are so personal. It's not even funny. There's archetypes and things that will carry over. Like we've talked about before, the idea of Santa Claus. If you say that to pretty much anyone in the world, we're all going to come up with pretty similar ideas. But it's still a personal thing. It's just like, you know, like you like the bone throwing thing. That is highly personal because you pick your own charms and bones. You know, tarot, I might see something in a card that you see something totally different. You know, it's all what you make of it. Right. You know? A snake in a dream to me is going to signify wisdom. It's going to be magic. It's going to be subconscious. Whereas I'm going to be like, we're all going to die, a snake. Exactly. Exactly. Very, very different thing. So a snake for shell would mean danger and warnings and be a bad thing. Whereas a snake for me would mean wisdom. Very, very different things. So you have to, when you're doing dream interpretation, journaling is key because you really have to write down how you felt when you saw those things in your dream. You're the one making up the interpretations, not a book. That's right. The book can help give you pointers and guide you in directions, but you really have to listen to yourself and your subconscious when you're doing dream interpretation. So fabulous book by Elohim Lifar for dream magic. It is packed full of spells, rituals, exercises, recipes, and information. It's a good read. I really liked it. Six brooms. <laughs> <laughs> Six brooms. Just a reminder that the broom rating system is completely arbitrary, made up, means nothing, and is subject to change if we change our minds. But we stand by it wholeheartedly. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> back it completely. <laughs> now, book number three, mm. I have a new author I am in love with, and his name is Jake Richards. Okay. Oh, so good. OMG. Backwoods Witchcraft, Conjure and Folk Magic from Appalachia by Jake Richards. I love his style of writing. I feel kind of like I'm having a conversation as opposed to maybe a lecture. Mm -hmm. I love the stories about the great grandma and the grandma, and it's just very relatable. And I like how it's kind of like, well, this is what my family did. And six miles down the road, Joe Blow did it different. I really like, I don't know, everything about this book. I really do. You know, I'm so glad that we have these last two together, just like the first two, because Backwoods Witchcraft was well-written, rich information, a lot of stories, and it made it all very relatable. Right. Just like Byron Ballard's book. I feel like these two books go together so well. It's the same kind of magic. It's that same kind of Appalachian folk magic. I feel like they're talking about, I don't want to say the same, but different, but you got, you know, Small Magics, H. Byron Ballard, this is about Appalachian folk magic. Backwoods Witchcraft, Jake Richards, also about Appalachian folk magic, but they're not the same book. No. And I love that. And they're both written in a very conversational, this is your friend. Right. I could practically hear Byron talking when I read her book. I heard it in her voice. Like you're being talked to, yeah. Yes, and you're just right there with both of them. You feel like you're in an intimate conversation with someone who is steeped in this Appalachian folklore magic information. And, you know, with Jake's book, I like how there's kind of, again, that try it. There's some, you know, how to's, uh, give this a try. Here's how this ritual, how we do it, how I do it, how my family does it. And I like the quote unquote household magic. This is what me and my grandmother and my great grandmother did, but I can't tell you what the neighbor did because the neighbor probably did something different, but this is what we did in our house. I want to take it back for just a minute here. You and I grew up, you grew up very much in a Pennsylvania Dutch Christian religious, but with all this folk magic. Those people were practicing powwow magic. I don't care what they told me growing up. That's what it was. That's what it was. 
And my family is Appalachian Mountain Hill people. We had rituals. They did things when a baby was born. They talked about people who had the sight. They talked about people who could help cure you. I wasn't allowed to wear white shoes after Labor Day. What? I don't even know why, but my grandma said no or bad things would happen. Bad things would happen. There you go. You weren't supposed to whistle in the house. You know, there was things in the woods that you weren't supposed to talk to if you saw. If you drop a knife, you can't use it. Different signs and symbols. And a lot of them wrapped up in Christian symbolic. Much like in Elohim's book, a lot of the South American folk magic has Christian themes running through it. Again, it's a blending of things, of family folk magic with very strong Christian streak through it. I don't know about you, Shell, but I think I kind of pushed a lot of that away when I left and went into witchcraft. I was like, well, I'm leaving that folk Christian magic behind. As you know, because you've known me forever, as you know, I never was able to kick a uh, Pennsylvania Dutch hex sign. Oh, those are awesome. I grew up with them. My grandma had them in the kitchen. My mother had them in our kitchen. I ended up having a set. And as much as I did kind of buck all of that, the one thing I never was able to to kick was the the hex sign love. And I think that I turned I turned away from it because of its association with Christianity. And it hasn't been until, you know, the last five, seven years that I've started to, you know, I can hear my grandmother when I'm cooking or making fire cider or, you know, putting incense or something together. I hear her advice a lot. And so I think the remembering the folk magic part of it, that part that's, you know, very old and connects us with our ancestors. I think a lot of us across the country are incorporating that even if we we don't take all of it, you know? Well, I, I remember telling you when we first got these books, the first thing it made me want to do was go to my storage unit and yank out all of my Pennsylvania Dutch hex signs and hang yep. them up. This kind of struck a chord. And what I like about the theme of kind of all four of these books is this is what I do or this is what we do, but I'm not negating what you do and what you do is equally is awesome and right and respected but this is what we do, but it's different two houses down. Yeah, this is my fire cider recipe from my family. I enjoy your fire cider recipe, but I know it's different. You know, they're right. still the same thing. The thing with a lot of this folk magic is there is a lot of quote unquote the same, but different. Yeah, and it really depends on the blend of who your people were. Who were the people that settled that land that you're living on? We're right. not even going to get into the Native American influences because there were so many different tribes, particularly up through the New England area where we live and, you know, all over this country that for good or for bad and about post colonized. Yeah, they left their mark as well. And they were so different. And then you have the Irish and the Scottish people. You have the Dutch people, the Germans and, you know, people came from all over and they're still coming from all over. And I think that's the best part of the U.S. is when things kind of blend like this. Well, you know, as an adult, looking back, I kind of laugh at my family, at least my mother's side. If anybody on my mother's side is listening, I apologize. But I laugh because even though they ended up in my generation in the southern tier of New York State, that part of my family is actually from like mid-Pennsylvania. And, you know, these people came to America the ones that went to Pennsylvania specifically to kind of start their own religious movement because they were trying to get away from religious persecution in Europe. And that kind of in a roundabout way is where the Pennsylvania Dutch thing came came from. But yet they just basically, in my opinion, they just mixed witchcraft and like Methodist slash Baptist beliefs into one big freaking happy ball and they called did. the damn Pennsylvania powwow shit. Like, I love these hex signs, but you know what they really are, in my opinion? They're spells made with they pictures. Are. They're basically like sigils, literal sigils. They're math magic, Shell. They are sigils. They're they're mathematical, beautiful, geometric sigils. They are magic. Absolutely. Yeah, there's a marriage one. There's a, a love one. There's a happiness one. You see them on barns a lot. Yeah, there's some to encourage fertility. There's some to encourage Protection. safety. Exactly. They're absolutely spells. 
Oh, I'm going to have to do We're going to have to do a whole episode on powwow magic because I'm, <laughs> yeah. but, but my point, my point is, is that I love that how all of these books kind of show you the diversity of what folk magic really is, because, you know, when you're talking about certain traditions, you know, like Alexandrian, for example, not a lot of diversity. There's a certain way it is. That's the way it is. You follow that way. With this, it's whatever floats your boat, man. You know, we talk about that all the time. Do what makes you happy. And that's almost the basis of folk magic. And we also are big on tradition and doing things this way because, you know, it feels good and you have the backing of it's been done this way by your family. And there is power in that. There's magic in that. You know, it's okay to change that too um, and do it your own way. So I think that's that's kind of why folk magic is having a resurgence right now. It's one thing to say some ancient Yahoo from God knows where doing God knows what did this is different than my great grandma did it. My grandma did it. My mother did it. My father did it. My grandfather did it. Like it's different. Right. This is my granny's recipe for unhexing oil. You know, that hits different. I got a Pennsylvania folk magic thing for you that What's my that? grandma and my great grandma did. And I have to share this with you guys because this is so ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. If you didn't feel good, you know what they made you eat? What's that? Tomato soup with a big old fat pad of butter melted on it. Who the hell eats tomato soup with butter? My family, that was their like freaking folk remedy. If you didn't feel good, you had to have tomato soup with butter on it. Nowadays, I'm like, no wonder everybody had cholesterol issues. <laughs> but hey, for them, that was some superstitious freaking mid-Pennsylvania remedy. And if you told my grandma you were sick, you were having damn tomato soup with a pad of butter in it. Uh, well, mine, it was garlic and peppers pretty much. So yeah. I'd rather the garlic and peppers. So granny recipes are definitely a lot of fun, but these books, I enjoyed reading them. The last two, very conversational, very interesting. They cover a lot of ground. You know, I want to quote a line from H. Byron Ballard's book on the back, because this is like the damn truth. It's as you're having a face-to-face -face lesson with her on her porch. That is exactly how this book reads. Legit. Yeah. But I say the same thing about Backwoods Witchcraft. It's like sitting in and having a convo. Love it. I agree. They were great. I actually recommend all four of these books, even though Dream Witchery is not my vibe. It is a really good book. All four of these five brooms, man. Yeah, fantastic. They were all really great. I agree. I recommend all of them. If you're looking for spells in particular, Dream Witchery has it. Heavily Christian flavored, heavily South American magic flavored. Yeah. And that is why probably it's not my vibe. But if that's your thing, man, this is the book for you. I, yep. I will say that. The North American Folk Magic is not a textbook. It is actually a very good read with lots of information in it. And substitutes as a weapon. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, she's not. It's huge. It's thick. It is thick, though. But, you know, small magics, love. I cannot wait, by the way. I know you said this at the beginning, but I can't wait to say it again. I cannot wait to meet. H. Byron Ballard at Sacred Space. I'm just saying that. And if she listens to our podcast, she probably doesn't because she's way cooler than us. But if she does, I can't wait to meet you. And what it says on the back of that book that it's just like sitting with her, it literally is. She's just, she's awesome. She's the cutest. But like I said, also when it comes to folk magic uh, info, Jake Richards, my new fave, gotta say it, my new fave, love how he writes, loves it, love his style, love his message, love what he's got to say. Excellent books. So my tea is empty, though, Shell. I drank all my tea, and I'll be honest with you, I smoked all my pipe, too. <laughs> Mine's empty as well. So we want to thank you all for joining us yet again in the solarium. Next time, we'll make sure Shell does not bogart all the weed. Lies. I do it every time. Don't listen she does. to her. It's true. We've had some requests for shadow work books, so we're going to try and do that. But if there's any tarot decks or books you want, let us know. I just want to put out there that you know, we absolutely love these solariums and hanging out with you guys. So we hope that you're having a little bit of a smoke if you can, a little bit of a tea if you can. And if you've got a minute to shoot us a message, we want to know what you're drinking and we definitely want to know what you're smoking. So hit us up at backonthebroomstick at gmail.com. Check out our Instagram, backonthebroomstick. Our website, backonthebroomstick. Oh my God, where else can they find us now that's kind of new? You can find us on YouTube. Ah! 
And we will have videos soon. Coming up here in just a couple weeks, we'll be going to the Sacred Space Conference in Townsend, Maryland. And we're going to document that shit. We are. We're going to try to get some videos up for you, at the very least a couple shorts where we say hi. And if you are a fan, if you are a listener and you are going to Sacred Space, give us a little hi. Just be like, hey, I'm a listener. Because we want to just in person tell you how much we appreciate you. Thank you so much for listening to this, Solari. We will see you next time when Shell and I get together for some sippable, smokable spells. I know we've had a bunch of listeners that have been uh, coming to Salem and they've been checking out the DM and Co. tea company that I've been telling about. If you've been here and you've got some tea from that company, let us know and I'll go try it and drink some and talk about it on an episode. So tell me what you're drinking. I'll go buy some and test it too. There you go. Let us know back on the broomstick at gmail.com. But until then, be wise, be wicked. And keep it witchy.